Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 26, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here, so thank you very much. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, and we'll have a lot to say about that. I saved all that for the live charts, so we'll just go through the live charts. It'll make a lot more sense where we are, what's going on, and I'll walk you through all that, obviously. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind questions and comments, keep them relative to the slides while we're on the slides. And then towards the end of the presentation, when I open it up for live charts, feel free to ask questions about anything. And then, of course, let me know if you want me to take a look at your favorite stock picks or let me know what stocks you'd like me to look at from a trend-following perspective, okay? And if you don't mind, wait till we get to the live charts for that, and that's for your benefit. And also, ask about one stock at a time. That's also for your benefit, too. So this week's focus is the process to successful trading. That'll make a lot more sense in just a minute. Before we get into that, there's the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, boring a line from my friend Greg Morris. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. As you know, I've been working on and off on a trading psychology course for a couple of years now, and when I go to do these presentations, when looking for inspiration, I start looking at all those presentations that I put together. And in a process, I found a flow chart, which was better than one of the charts that I had used a while back to explain things, a little bit more simpler. And I thought it'd be a good idea to walk you through that this morning. So let's talk about following the process to successful trading. And process is really the key word in that sentence. So we all start out looking for a methodology. Now, we have to be careful as I preach and teach not to end up on a holy grail hunt. If I could go back in time and tell, talk to that younger punk version of me, I would say, look, just keep it really, really simple. And what amazes me is over the years, after going through all this complexity, I've peeled away nearly all of that and kept it really, really simple. And I'm still experimenting with a few things, but they're really, really simple, such as the concept of daylight. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more details in a few minutes. Now, if it's not simple and conceptually correct, which I'm going to break down here in just one second, go back to researching a methodology. Once you find something, make sure you have the confidence in it. Make sure you truly believe in what you're doing. If not, go back to the drawing board. This process is relatively cheap. You could buy some books on trading. You can get some courses. I say relatively cheap because courses aren't necessarily cheap. I know mine aren't, but it's a lot cheaper than trading and winging it and losing a lot of money in the markets. And you'll... I've got a few, I'm, we're in the process of downsizing and I'm looking at all these books in my bookshelves and I could probably throw away 80% of them at least. I've been doing a lot of Pareto principle thinking and reading lately. In fact, I'm reading a book actually called 80-20 and it's got me thinking about everything in life, including trading, focusing on the 20% of trading that produces 80% of the profits. Anyway, and looking at all these books, I could probably throw away 80% of them, and I might just do that before I move. But once you have the confidence, you need to go ahead and do your, obviously, your analysis, looking for your setups. And once you have confidence in that analysis, then you're able to end up in the planning phase. Now, before you do that, if you don't have confidence, then you need to go back to the analysis. This is the hard part. We crave action as humans, as successful people, you crave action. You would not be here today if you weren't a person of action. And I, again, am humbled by your presence, so thank you for attending. 
But a lot of times you do a lot of analysis and you end up with nothing, and that's okay. But once you do find something, then you need to plan out your trade. And that's pretty simple. And I'll break it down. But each one of these we could spend a lot more time on. But I'll give you a thumbnail that's going to get you started. That planning, you'll have an entry, a stop, an initial profit target, and a trailing stop. Now, once you have that planned out, and that's the easy part again, that's fairly mechanical, the planning process, because we can look at the volatility of the market, stock, forex, whatever we're trading, and whatever time frame we're trading, and we could say, okay, well, this stock, let's say we're trading a stock, is bouncing around about three or four points a day, about four or five points or so over a week. So I know my stop has to be outside of that normal range. Where would I be wrong in the setup? All these things I preach when we talk about money management. So that's going to be fairly mechanical in that planning process. And once you determine where that stop should be, where would you be wrong? What is outside? Where would it be outside of that volatility of that market? Then you determine where you're going to put your initial protective, I'm sorry, your initial profit target. And that's going to be actually a function of how far the, a way to stop is. And I'll walk you through that in just one second. And then, of course, you need to think about how you're going to trail your Protective stop. Initially, that's going to be one for one. Let's say you're risking five points on a trade. Stock goes up one point. You're going to raise your protective stop to five points below where the market closes. You're going to do that on a one for one basis, and then you're going to gradually let that open up to make the transition to longer term trader. Oh, the question is, uh, did I find the author to the so Socrates era book? Uh, Frenchy, I think that was... Um, I think it, I mean, it sounded like Socrates. It's uh, Descartes, D-E-C-A-R-T-E-S, but I think it's pronounced Descartes. Descartes' era was the name of the book uh, that was asked about last week. So once you are done with the planning phase, you need to get into the execution phase. Now, the execution phase is a process. And the secret to trading, and I'm always saying there's no secret to trading. And then it's like, well, here's the secret to trading. But here is the secret to trading is the process. And following the process, you have an entry. You have a stop. You have an initial profit target and a trailing stop. All you have to do, I know, all you have to do, easier said than done, as I say ad nauseum. My wife, it comes to fixing, when it comes to fixing a leaky faucet or something, well, all you have to do is tighten it up. Well, you tighten it up, and then it starts squirting out water, and before you know it, you go to the plumbing store, and you're replumbing all kinds of things, and it turns into a big mess, literally and figuratively. So a lot of times, it's a lot easier on the surface than it really is, but in reality, it's not nearly as hard as we Make it. And I don't want to go off on a tangent too far, but one thing, I know, imagine that. But one thing I thought about this morning is I was going to initially talk a little bit about embracing our own psychology as a microcosm of, of what's really out there in the overall market. Yogi Berra once said, if the world weren't perfect, I'm sorry, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And I've taken that line and put it into my psychology teachings. And I think that was also in Trading Full Circle, where I took the word world out and put market in. If the market were perfect, it wouldn't be. Markets do not exist on a perfect level. They exist on an emotional level. Write that down. So when you're feeling, uh, when you're dropping that F-bomb, and I've already dropped a few this morning, truth be told, and you'll see why in a minute. But when you're dropping that F-bomb, think about how you feel and think about how other people feel about the markets. And it's the psychology of those other participants which allows you to profit through technical analysis, not on every trade, obviously, but longer term, if you could read the mind and the emotions of the markets while embracing your own mind and emotions, your life will get a lot easier. 
And I'll show you a few things in just a second that's going to make that process much, much easier. <laughs> now, after it's all done, the probably one of the best things you do, you could do, the most important things ever that you could do is a post-mortem. Did you follow the proper process? Did you pick the best and leave the rest? Okay. Did you trade? Did you plan that trade and trade that plan? That's something that we've beaten the dead horse on quite a bit. Now, after you've done all that, then go back to doing, doing your analysis, rinse, and repeat. Now, let's break down some of these things. So when you're researching your methodology, again, make sure it's simple and conceptually correct. Come back to the methodology research if it is not. You should be able to draw your methodology with a crayon. And as I'll beat the dead horse in a minute, or in a cocktail napkin. Now, I've been working on the learning management system on my website. And phase one of that was to get a course into it, which I've succeeded. I've actually got two courses, a micro course and the trading full circle course. A learning management system, you have to... Take one segment, pass a test, move to the next segment. It's laid out in order. As I've said ad nauseum lately, one of my peers told me, a business, more, he's more of a business associate, but anyway, he said, look, you've got a lot of great content on your website. Why do you hide it? So I'm trying to bring that content to light through a learning management system, and it's going to be a tremendous amount of work and I might accept some beta testers uh, really soon here. I've already got uh, an intern that's going to be doing some work for me but I, I might be willing to take on some beta testers if you really do, uh, do a lot of work. Anyway through that process I'm discovering a lot of good old content if I say so myself or got a lot of relevant content not necessarily old and in converting the IPO course over I came across the term conceptually correct observational finance. By the way, if you ever do purchase a course, anytime I upgrade it, redo it, or enhance it, you do have access to that for lifetime. So as soon as I get the IPO course finished, which is taking a long time to do, by the way, I will give everybody who has previously purchased it access to the new learning management system. And it's some really good stuff, if I say so myself, and I'm pretty excited about it. And a lot of it's still working in spite of the aggravating market conditions. Anyway, long story endless, I know too late. I came across this term, conceptually correct observational finance. Conceptually correct is borrowed from Larry Connors a long time ago when I did a little research with him. I would sometimes just discover something by accident, and he's like, well, but what's the concept behind it? And if we couldn't really wrap our head around the concept, we would toss it out. But a lot of things that made sense, or if you could find something, I should say, that makes sense from a psychological aspect. Remember, again, we're just reading the psychology of the market. That's our whole job. Then you might have something. Just make sure you observe it over and over again. Now, this morning I got to thinking, what would that be or what would be an easy example of that? Well, I think the trend knockout pattern would qualify. It's very, very simple. You're looking for a market in a strong, strong, strong trend followed by a sharp sell-off. And that's the entire pattern. That's it. That's the entire setup. Why does that work? Well, it knocks out the Johnny-come-latelys. Johnny-come-latelys are traders that are late to the game. They tend to be super emotional. Everybody's emotional in this game, remember, but the Johnny Come Latelys tend to be super emotional. They don't have a lot of staying power. And that's either through lack of money or lack of patience or some combination thereof. And these Johnny Come Latelys are the absolute worst traders. They sort of throw in the towel, buy it, whatever the cost is, and then they immediately get shaken out of the market on the first little signs of a correction. Now, if you're already in a market in trend-following mode, a lot of times it's the Johnny-come-latelys that will knock you out of perfectly good positions. 
Now, if the market begins a rally, they have to put up or shut up. In other words, they have to either buy back in or let the market go without them. And a lot of times what will happen from a psychological standpoint is they will let that market begin to take off without them and then once again throw in the towel and it becomes a bit of a rinse and repeat. That, in addition to the shorts, which we'll talk about now with this simple little pattern, can help to propel the market higher and in some cases could actually make the market go parabolic. As I often say in a lot more details actually, but as I often say, shorts tend to have a bit more of an ego. They like to pick tops. In fact, I found out a couple of years ago that, that short, there's a shorting strategy called shorting the parabolics. Um, that's one of those things that'll work until it don't. But God bless you if that's what you want to do. Very dangerous way to trade. As far as I'm concerned, I think it's just gambling, especially after talking with some of these guys who might mar margin their account five times or whatever the case is to get in these positions. But anyway, long story endless, shorts tend to confuse the issue with facts and sell a market that's going higher. And when that market begins to sell off, they feel pretty darn good. But when that market begins to snap right back, in other words, if you get a trigger on the setup, then all of a sudden they're immediately losing money. And a lot of times, as I just said, these shorts are very, very leveraged. So they don't have a lot of staying power and they're going to be forced to buy back the market. Now, once again, they have a bit of an ego. So they might not buy it back as soon as it triggers a TKO. They might buy it back a little bit later in the process when it begins to squeeze them out. And again, all of this action can make a market go parabolic. In fact, if you think about it, and some of these things I learn after the fact, but I often say that a TKO through my observational finance here, by looking at charts, my empirical research, a TKO could be a wonderful pattern to get into a parabolic trend because the trend begins to go parabolic, and now I know the shorts are shorting it, and the Johnny Come Latelys are going to shake it out, especially. So sometimes you got a market going straight up. You wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole because it's too dangerous. But then you get a whack and that market sells off really, really hard. Well, you know some people have been shaken out. And sometimes you get a parabolic move, a TKO, and then that move will go right back parabolic. The market will go right back parabolic. So when you're boiling down a trend, when you're boiling down a system, excuse me, let me remind that group. When you're boiling down a system, as I said, I believe in last week's presentation, you're either a trend follower or not. Now, if you're not a trend follower, well, guess what? A new trend better develop soon. So if you're shorting a market because it's high, that market better start trending lower. So if you're up here, if the market's up here, you shorten that market somewhere up here, well, that market better start trending lower for you to profit. From here to here is your profit. So if you're fighting a trend, a new trend in the new direction, better develop soon, in the opposite direction, better develop soon. Now, as I often say, all systems can be boiled down to much simpler systems. I've been in many presentations where there's 100 buy and sells on a chart, but usually there's a moving average plotted, and instead of all of that buying and selling, you'll have like buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, all these little arrows on the chart. A lot of times just following a moving average would have kept you on the right side of the market. I didn't draw that very well. So let's say you have all these buys and sells on a chart with their little system. Sometimes something as simple as buying when you have daylight, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average, will help to keep you on the right side of the market. So you end up with one signal instead of numerous buys and sells. So I'm willing to bet virtually all simple systems can be boiled down. I'm sorry, virtually all systems can be boiled down to much simpler systems. Even the simple stuff that I do, such as bow ties, which I think is very, very simple, when I go back and look at something like Daylight, which I discovered long before bow ties back in the mid-90s, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Maybe this Daylight concept 
is just as good or very useful at, at the least as the bow tie is. The other thing too is simple systems are a lot easier to follow than more complex ones. And if you can't follow a simple system, then what makes you think you can follow a complex one? So before, let's say you do have something that's complex and you think it's great, well, first of all, try to boil it down to something much more simpler. Also realize everything works better with trends. So the bottom line is if you have the market that's trending, then something as simple as a moving average or even, even more simpler, a big blue arrow will keep you on the right side of the market, will keep you in that potential trade for a long, long time. So, again, simple systems are much easier to follow than more complex ones. The other thing I would argue against complex systems is be careful if someone shows you some amazing, and I use the quote on paper, results. I, I ask for people not to send me systems. In other words, I don't, please don't send me your system. Unless you want to pay me a lot of money to do some consulting, and unless you're okay with me being devil's advocate and ripping it apart, then then don't send it to me, okay? But I do get systems on occasion, unsolicited, and sometimes I'll see some things with amazing results, and I'll say, okay, well, you think you got something here. I'll try to shoot a few holes in it. It's like, well, trade it for a few years and get back to me. No one has gotten back to me yet from that. So be leery of those on paper results. I told the systems designer once that his biggest drawdown as a mechanical system trader was in front of him and he got very angry at me. And I think that's very dangerous to have to have that much confidence in your system that you don't you don't believe that a drawdown could be ahead of you, especially if something that's mechanically tested on back data. You have to be very careful not to fall in love too much with your system. Usually trading it for a few years and having your ass handed to you will solve for that problem. But do be careful about anything that has, shows amazing uh, on-paper results. In the early 2000s, a lot of system writers came out of the woodwork and showed you all these amazing systems. Because in 1999, and a little bit earlier than that too, the market went pretty much straight up. So these systems look pretty darn good. Heck, a buy and hold system would look pretty good right now, at least up until now, going all the way back to, what, 2009. But be careful because there's a lot of curve fitting that can happen. Now, as I said a minute ago, there's this slide you see over and over in these presentations. If you can't draw it on a cocktail napkin, then toss it out. There are systems out there where you could ask six different people what the system is saying, and I don't want to throw anybody in the bus, but you're going to get six different answers. Whereas with my methodology, and it's not the be all end all, I'm sure there's some other methodologies out there too that are worthwhile. But with my methodology, you can show me a setup that either it is or it isn't a setup. It's pretty obvious as opposed to some of these more arcane things. You're going to have six guys arguing over what the setup is, whether it is a setup or not, and whether it's an uptrend, downtrend, etc. Now, as I said, in recent times, one thing that kind of really gets my goat is these one-hit wonders and these inflated claims. And I think that once I get all of my content in place into the learning management system, I think I'm going to spend a little bit more time looking into some of these inflated claims and one-hit wonders and fleshing that out a little further. And I just said I wouldn't throw anybody in the bus, so I have to be careful not to do that. But I would like, I think, ultimately, I would like to unearth some of this bullshit out there, pardon my French. One hit wonders. I've seen people do amazing things. I have know of people who've done amazing things in the market. 
As I often say, I watched a good friend of mine turn about 5K into a million, but then he round tripped it. I encouraged him to cash out and rinse and repeat. Let's do it again. If you're that good, do it again. And um, I guess the reason I said let's, it's like I'll, I'll go along with you for the ride. You know, I'll put up 5K to, if you could do it again, but he couldn't. And it, it ended really badly for him in more than one way. He's no longer in the service, so we can talk about him. There are people out there that in the late 90s did incredibly well. And here we are 20 years later, roughly, and they're talking about how great they are. Well, oh, what have you done for me lately? Can you rinse and repeat? Can you turn that 10K into 20K or whatever it was? I'm sorry, 10K into 20 million. Can you do that again? Probably not. I know someone. I met him once. I don't want to be those purposes like Persons that like, oh, I know him. It's like, okay, I don't know him. I met him once in person. He knows who I am. I know who he is. Anyway, he made millions and millions and millions of dollars many years ago. And he told me flat out, Dave, I was in the right place at the right time. You can actually read about him in some of these trading books. He's very famous. And he flat out says he could never do it again in current market conditions. Now, he is not holding himself out there as the be-all, end-all guru. He just made many, many millions of dollars by being in the right place at the right time. Now, you can't take that away from him. I think everyone here has probably been in the right place at the right time and didn't capitalize on it. And then in hindsight, it's like, geez, I was at the right place at the right time. <laughs> but he'll tell you flat out that he could not do it. So it's disingenuous for anyone to imply repeatability. So the question is, can you rinse and repeat? Can you follow their methodology and do these great things that they did at least once? Can they do it again? And I would say no, they probably can't. So don't get caught up in these inflated claims. Keep it super duper simple. Learn how to do something real simple. Learn how to trade something really simple. And as I'll show you in a second, learn how to follow that process. And I'll show you a few hints on how to do that. And then if you want to get a little bit more complex with things, do a little bit more research, then by all means. But don't get too far away from those basic simple concepts like the only way to ever make money on a trade is to capture a trend. So don't venture too far away from that trend following simple system. The other thing is what would happen if they got hit by a beer truck? Sometimes there's some people out there who have proprietary systems. If you're following someone running a proprietary system and something happens to them, well, what happens? So make sure you fully understand what they are doing. If anything, I have probably done too good a job. I know it's going to sound a little egotistical, but in some cases I've probably done too good a job where I've taught so much and so well that I've worked myself out of a job. I talked about the IPO course earlier. I had people quit the trading service because when the trading service was doing well, I mean, I have bad periods too. It hasn't been great lately, truth be told. But even during good periods, I've had people quit the trading service because after going through the IPO course, they were doing so great in IPOs that they no longer wanted to trade stocks in general. They just want to focus on IPOs. And I explained to them, well, we happen to be in an IPO bull market. Just keep me on staff to look at those other stocks for you and maybe give you some ancillary ideas just in case this bull market ends. But that's just one case of me working myself out of a job. But that's OK. Uh, from an egotistical standpoint, it makes me feel pretty good. From a money mat, from a monetary standpoint, from an educational business, obviously, I lose a client in the process. But that's okay. At least I could sleep at night. So once you find the methodology, it's something simple. You have the confidence in it. Make sure you have embrace that system or that methodology or that pattern of setup and 
fully understand its nuances. So you do have that confidence in it. Now, the best way to do that would be to find at least 100 examples. Some good, some bad, some mediocre. We have two dangers from a psychological standpoint, from a human being standpoint. We have two dangers. One is selective perception and one is perceptual distortions. They kind of go hand in hand. Selective perception would be you're looking at your trading system and you're just picking out the winners and you're failing to realize that there were a lot of bad trades that would have occurred following that. So you need to look at the good, the bad, and the mediocre, and you really need to be your own, as I preach over and over again, devil's advocate. Now, once you do have something, you need to do your analysis, obviously, and make sure you have confidence in your analysis. Now, how do you get confidence in your analysis? Well, you leave no stone, no stone unturned. So just to give you an example, for me, that means looking at several thousand stocks. Now, this takes up to two hours a day. I've actually got the process down to a lot smaller time frame than it used to be. And part of my problem, I think it used to be, I used to get a little distracted. And now I'm working to get more and more focused when I do my analysis. And I could probably do my analysis in one hour if I'm not interrupted. But I'm looking at several thousand stocks. Now, I've looked at stocks enough to where I can go through this list maybe in 30 minutes or less. I can look at a couple thousand stocks. I'm not doing in-depth analysis on each stock. If I find a stock that looks remotely interested, I'll flag it, and I'll do a little in-depth analysis later on. I think that, kind of borrowing a line from Malcolm Gladwell from Blink, or boring his line of reasoning, I think once you know what you're looking for, then it becomes very obvious, and in a blink of a second, you're, you're able to recognize that. If you're just starting out and looking at a lot of charts, then by all means, spend all day looking at charts until you get enough repetitions in, until you can whittle that down to about a half an hour in the process. I also look at several hundred sectors and or ETFs in the process. Now, looking at a couple thousand stocks or several thousand stocks, whatever the case may be, I get a pretty good feel for what's actually going on within the market. If I see debacle du jour after debacle du jour, meaning a stock selling off really hard after one after another, after another, after another, I know that the market may be coming a little unglued. If I see a few stocks shooting straight up, then I have to wonder, well, maybe things are, are pretty good. If I see, if I can't find a setup to save my life, then I know that maybe the market is choppy. And then I come back to the sectors. I'm sort of doing a top-down approach in a bottom-up fashion. So start with the stocks, look at the sectors, and then look at the indices for a little bit more analysis. But in looking at those stocks, I know if the market's choppy, headed up, headed down, whether or not most stocks are headed down or whether or not most stocks are headed up or whether or not most stocks are just headed sideways. Doing a lot of that empirical advanced decline research. There's been some great advanced decline research done by many people. Greg Morris is the first that comes to mind. He's done a lot of advanced decline research, and it's pretty impressive stuff. And I just like to look at a lot of charts to get my own feel for what's really going on under the hood. Now, looking at those sectors, I confirm what I'm seeing. If most sectors are trading sideways, then I know it's a choppy market. But I already knew that because I couldn't find any setups to begin with. And then, of course, I'll look at several major indices. And then, as needed, I'll look at other markets. I don't necessarily go out every day and look at gold or silver 
or copper or the dollar or bonds. But I probably should. But I'll look at them a couple times a week or whenever needed. Like right now, the dollar is taking off. I'm short the euro, FYI. I don't know if I have to disclose that, but I'm short the euro, which means I guess I'm kind of long the dollar. And with the dollar taking off, that's going to put pressure or it has put pressure on commodities. So right now, that's important. The dollar is important. It's important to keep an eye on the dollar. As I've said quite often, read Intermarket Technical Analysis by John Murphy. It's on my website under books-2-read. DaveLander.com slash books-2-read. But just remember, as Murphy says, there's long lead and lag times. And these things can decouple. So it doesn't necessarily mean that oil can't go up or other commodities can't go up when the dollar is going up, too. Now, once you have confidence in your analysis, you're in the planning phase. What do we have to do to plan? Well, from the way I see it, we have an entry, a stop, initial profit target, a trailing stop. Just those four things, and that's it. So if we look at my so-called nutshell screen, this is straight from the layman's guide to trading stocks. Shoot me an email. I'll tell you how to get it for free. Or you can get it off my website. It's $27 on the website. Basically, we're looking for the pullback is what we're trading. The transitional pattern is a little bit more complex or a little bit more harder to recognize. But the core methodology, for the most part, we're looking for a pullback. We're going to enter if and only if that strong trend begins to resume after a correction. We're going to put a stop in place in case we're wrong. And if things work out swimmingly for us, we're going to take partial profits and we're gonna trail that stop higher. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. I know. Simple, huh? Well, simple does not necessarily mean easy. And then once, or if, I should say, we get that initial profit target and that market continues higher, we're gonna gradually widen our stop. Now, initially, as I alluded to, the stop is going to look like that, kind of stair step, step higher as the price goes higher. But once we get that initial profit target out of the position, and if the stock or whatever the market might be keeps going higher, then we're going to let that stop gradually loosen up. And it's a start longer term. A lot of times I get asked, is that a moving average? The quick answer is no, but yes, it will begin to look like a moving average. And it will be a longer term moving average. And let me just throw something out here for a little research. One thing I thought about and I've experimented with before, but I just prefer to do it manually. But you could start out with maybe a short term moving average here and then increase the periods of that moving average. So your moving average would look like this and then begin to flatten out and work your way towards a longer term moving average. That would be a pretty cool way to trail stops. But I think I'm already doing that by allowing those stops to gradually loosen out. But if somebody uh, does that, has a little experience with it, and is successful, uh, let me know. That would be fun to, uh, to look at. So your execution is actually doing these things, okay? And that is a process. I cannot exaggerate enough process. The fact that it's a process. Just follow the plan. I know, easier said than done. There is one way you can make this a little easier. As I often say, decisions are tough and stressful. Now, you think, well... My little decision on what I'm going to have for lunch today that isn't stressful. Well, there's a little tiny bit of stress in that, a little bit more stress than you might realize. Because in order to make a decision, you have to weigh what the outcome, the consequences, I should say, of that decision might be. So as I often say, because I'm, I'm 
Big Dave. I'm still Big Dave. I lost 40 pounds, but I found 10 of them. <laughs> but uh, I, I know what causes that. Anyway, I, I like greasy food. So a lot of times I'll want to eat catfish for lunch, fried catfish. But I know that if I eat that fried catfish, I'm going to be lethargic in the afternoon. I won't get a lot of work done and I won't be operating at my peak performance. So a little decision like that, which seems inconsequential, does have some consequences. So we must reduce the amount of decisions that we make. And the easiest way to do that is to make as many trading decisions as possible, passive decisions. Let the market take you out. Let the market make a decision for you. That way, you didn't actually make that decision. Yes, you made a decision to make it a passive one, but you don't have to constantly berate yourself on that decision. You let the market be the final arbiter and make that decision for you. For instance, let's say that you come into the market or the market opens, I should say, and you're going to get into the stock. Well, let's say that your entry is up here around 10 bucks a share or at 10 bucks a share. Let's make it accurate. So what's going to happen is you're going to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm, let's just take out this stop for a second. So I'm going to buy this market if it hits $10 the stock or whatever the market may be. So what happens? Let's say that it hits $10 in fairly earning trading, fairly early trading. Let me start that over. Okay, so let's say we're going to buy the stock at $10 and the market opens and fairly early in the morning it hits that $10 entry point. So what do you do? Well, your plan says that you're going to buy the stock. So you get your order ready to go, you're getting ready to hit enter, and what happens? Let's say the overall market begins to tank. Market begins to sell off intraday, it looks like that. So now you're thinking, hmm, market's selling off, maybe I shouldn't buy this stock, and guess what happens? The stock begins to sell off, okay, after triggering that enter, entry. So you didn't take the entry, you avoided your first decision, or going with your first decision, and market's selling off, and the stock's selling off, you feel pretty good. But what happens if that stock turns around? And there's a million different combinatorics of how this all could shake out. But let's say it turns around and re-triggers. What do you do now? Well, the market's going down. Maybe I better sit on my hands. Well, let's say the stock continues to rally. Now what do you do? So instead of that one simple decision, you've created a half a dozen and maybe even more. So how do you avoid making all those decisions? Well, let's say you come in. Now you have to wait for the market to open. But let's say the market opens here or even down here. Anywhere below this stop, okay? Sorry about that. I have, um, I have to keep my phone on. There's been some um, family issues lately. So my apologies for that. Hey, what about what about putting on silent? Well, I'll never remember. Turn it back on. <laughs> so we'll edit that out. Anyway, so let's say the market opens here or here or anywhere below this entry. You can put in an actual buy stop and go about your life. Every time I do this, it's kind of, it's kind of, I kind of feel giddy about it. Sometimes I'll get really, really busy, or try to keep myself busy at least, because if I'm not, I'm going to be firing off day trades and doing a lot of trading that I shouldn't be doing. But I'm always amazed. I'll put in a buy stop, and then I'll go about my life, and then all of a sudden I'll get an email saying that I filled into a position. I'm like, oh, I forgot I even put that in there. Well, that passive decision is a lot easier for me than making an active one because I guarantee you I'm going to be that little paranoid guy watching that market, trying to outsmart that market. I know my own human nature. I know my own nature, I should say. So just putting in a buy stop will get me into markets that I want to be in and not outthink it 
and keep me out of markets that I don't want to be in because the market is not cooperating. Now, let's say we put in that little buy stop. So that's decision number one made. No problem. Well, as soon as you get a fill, go ahead and throw in a protective stop. Now, this is going to be a day order, and I'll show you why in one second. But this is going to be a day order. And the reason why is in case you ever want to use a little bit of discretion. So let's say this market tanks. Well, you're not down here like the deer in the headlights. You just get stopped out. And it happens every now and then, spelled with a silent SH. You get triggered into position and you get knocked out. Well, it sucks. And an F-bomb usually follows, at least for me. Very emotional. We're talking about downsizing. I have a separate office detached from the house right now. I drop a lot of F-bombs. I make a lot of noise over here. And I told my wife, it's just going to be her and I. We don't need a complete separate structure guest house. If I move into one of the bedrooms in a smaller house, she's going to have to get used to me screaming and hollering. I told this morning, if you do hear me screaming and hollering, do not come in and check on me. <laughs> that would probably not be a good idea. But, yes, it will happen sooner or later in your career more often than I would like, but you will get triggered in and stopped out. That's okay. It comes with the territory. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. But let's say the market busts through that stop and it keeps dropping. Well, what do you do now? Well, then you start to say, well, maybe it'll bounce. It's oversold. You'll start to do some sort of reasoning. What if the stock market begins to rally and your stock's way down here? Well, the stock market's rallying. Maybe it'll come back. Okay. And what can happen, and I'm, in, I'm not talking about a discretionary situation where you have an opening gap reversal. I'm talking about a bona fide sell-off where it keeps on going. I have the luxury of working with a lot of smart people, but a lot of times some of these same smart people just fail to give up on a position because they're not quitters. And they email me when the stock is down 50% after their stop was hit and they didn't honor the stop. So make that decision a passive one on the stop. Now you could also, once you are, the market begins to move in your favor, you could actually put your trailing stop in and all that is is a protective stop that's moved higher. And you could put in that protective stop and go about your life. Again, it becomes a passive decision. That market tanks, it takes you out. It's weird if I have, I guess it's not weird because it's, it's what I'm preaching. If I put in a stop and get stopped out and I log on and check my portfolio and I see that stock's no longer in my portfolio, I'm like, oh, I must have got stopped out. Okay. If I'm watching the stock after it hits my stop, then I get frustrated and angry and then I try to figure out whether or not I should stay with the position or not. So all of a sudden, it becomes many, many decisions. And with those decisions come what? A lot of stress. But by putting in an actual stop, it helps to remove that level of stress. Now, what I like to do in some cases, if the market is far away from my stop, I'll put in a hard stop for a protective stop or a protective trailing stop. What I like to do, and I would recommend you only do this if you have a little bit more discipline, but what I like to do is set alerts for around my stop. If it's getting kind of close, I like to set an alert to let me know, and then I'll go in and take action. Sometimes you can survive a stock nick like that. You have to be very, very careful and not let a market get away from you when that happens. Trading is unfair in that, obviously, if you lose 50% of your account, you got to make back 100% just to get back to break even. So a few trades get away from you. If a few trades get away from you, it can really screw up your performance. Now, Once you are in a position and you've trailed that stop higher, when it comes to taking the partial profits and following the plan, there's two things you can do. 
you could set an alert to let you know, and that's why I mentioned alerts earlier. Now, alerts do require additional action. You will have to make a decision to eat a battle, but if that decision is already made for you, if you already know you're gonna take profits, let's say uh, this was 10 bucks a share, and let's say this is 12, we know we'd look for a $2 profit, okay? So what you could do is set an alert, it's like, okay, I got 12 bucks, but it, it continues to go higher. I got 12 bucks. I mean, I'm sorry. I've got two dollars out of the trade. It's at 12 bucks, but it continues to go higher. Then maybe you could say, well, let me just see if I could squeeze a few extra bucks out of this trade. The problem, obviously, with setting an alert would be if it hits 12, it comes back in. Then you have to have the discipline to go ahead and exit as it begins to come back in. And you might not get that full two dollars out of the trade, but you might get enough to where if you're disciplined to where it's still a decent amount of money. So set an alert if you're disciplined. The other thing that the alert will do is it'll stop you from watching the screen all day long. You only need to be alerted when you need to take action. And I'm going to talk about getting the reps in in a few minutes. But once you get the reps in, you're going to feel it's going to you're going to let me just rewind that. Once you get the reps in, then the alert becomes more of a mechanical type of thing for you. When I get an alert, it's like, oh, I got an alert. My stop has been hit. I need to get out. So you need to almost be mechanical in your actions and getting out of the market. Unless, of course, you get like an immediate reversal. But in the case like this, let's say you hit that alert for that profit target and that market starts coming back in you almost mechanically will exit that trade. And again, you'll need to get the reps in. Until you actually get those reps in, or if you just know yourself, I'm not a big fan of limit orders, okay? Never use a limit order to get into a trade unless you're trading after hours, which I think you have to use a limit order. I did one the other day. And just make sure you give it enough room to get in. A limit order could keep you from getting into a stock. If you read, may I have your order, please? I think I did that in layman's. I know it's in trading full circle, but I talk a lot about the dangers of limit orders on the entry. So rather than reinvent the wheel, take a look at those things. But one time you can use a limit order would be, let's say you're long, I don't know, a thousand shares of this stock. Then you could put in a limit order to sell 500 because we're taking profits, right? Partial profits at this price and sometimes the market will spike up you'll get triggered on that and it might come right back in so that's the only time i would suggest that you actually put in an order if you wanted if you wanted to okay i think if you had a little more discipline use an alert but if you're in a learning process or can't or don't want to watch a screen then by all means you could use a limit order to get you out of half of those shares and then once again what has happened We've made this a passive decision. So we know we want to buy at this level. We know we're going to put a stop at this level. We have an idea how we're going to trail that stop, and we know where our initial profit target is. So let's make this a passive decision, a passive decision, a passive decision, and a passive decision. And guess what? As I preach, planning the trade is pretty easy, okay? Trading the plan is hard. Well, if you make all of this or as much as possible a passive decision, then your life gets a hell of a lot easier. I think if you walked away with anything today, making passive decisions will probably save you longer term. You certainly, I mean, barring God forbid, the mother of all opening gap reversals or opening gaps, I should say, but you certainly, again, barring huge opening gaps, you certainly won't end up with a position down 50% after your stop is hit. And you certainly will have taken partial profits on a position that turns around and turns into a stinker, provided, of course, it hits that initial profit target. So as I often preach, money management will cure a multitude of sins. And on top of that, Making passive decisions, letting the market make decisions for you, will cure even more. Now, I alluded to this earlier. 
you have to get the reps in. You have to place an order, get triggered in, place a stop, be willing to get stopped out, take partial profits, trail a stop. You have to do this over and over again until it becomes second nature to you. It becomes automatic. As I said before, I have a bit of, it sounds a little weird, but I talk to some people like, no, Dave, that's, that's how it feels. Sometimes I have a bit of an out-of-body experience when it comes to placing these orders and trades. It's kind of like, well, what the hell did I just do? And I'll have to go back in and look at the transactions to see what I did. It becomes somewhat automatic. And the, the way you get to that level is you actually have to get the reps in. Part of the learning management system, I've been doing a little, little research into these type of things, and one thing they recommend is audience engagement. And one way, and the reason is because they looked at some of these sites out there, and this is not necessarily trading related, but it can be. But a lot of these sites where they have courses and there is an 8% finish rate in a lot of these courses. And it's kind of interesting. They looked at like motivational self-help. That's like a whopping 12%. Well, those people tend to be a little bit more motivated anyway. So you're going to get a little bit higher <laughs> from a higher result from them. But in round numbers, 90% of people who take a course do not finish the course. And I'm guilty. I was learning Italian a while back. I took a course, never finished. I got a couple of Italian courses here. I've never finished. I'm not proud of that. It's just how we're wired. So what happened was I was not engaged. So one way to increase engagement would be for to give the user an assignment, to give the client, the student, I should say, to give the student an assignment. So one thing I'm kind of toying with, once you get through all this information, is in order to get it to go further or graduate, however you want to look at it, then you need to upload one trade. And even if you're in a learning phase, that's fine. You don't have to actually have to place an actual trade, but give me the trade plan ahead of time and show me in real time where you would have followed the plan. And we'll get a timestamp on that. But that's one of the things I'm toying about is just do it for one trade. Now, I've done many columns on this before, and that's how you get the reps in. And I'm not a tough love kind of guy as I preach, but if you can't follow a plan for just one trade, then you might need to rethink this trading thing, okay? But you could do it. Okay, now, once you have completed the process, you need to do a post-mortem. And that's one of the, the most important things you could do. As I've said before, I've done post-mortems post -mortems years in the past. In the past, I've done these post-mortems, and I'm thinking, what the hell was I thinking? And in more recent times, I'm like, ah, it wasn't maybe the best setup in the world, but it looked pretty damn good going in. I have no regrets on taking that trade. Yes, it sucked. It turned into a loss. If I could turn back time, would I still take the trade? Yes, because it still looked pretty darn good at the time. So in going through that process, you just have to ask yourself, was it, let's say you're doing trend following with a trend resumption type of pattern such as TKO. Was the market accelerating in its trend? Was the market persistent in its trend? Was a TKO move meaningful enough? Was ideally the sector also trending? Was the overall market trending? It's going to be really hard at this point in time, for reference, this is being recorded again on April 26, 2018, but right now the market is real choppy. So it's going to be really hard for all those pieces to fit. So you're going to have to take a setup on a standalone basis. You're going to have to have the mother of all setups before taking it. 
And when you do the postmortem, you're like, okay, well, I knew going in that the sector wasn't this, wasn't trending, that the market wasn't trending, other stocks within the sector weren't trending, but I really, really like this setup. And I think that, or at least I thought that it could act on a standalone basis without all those other pieces fitting. So be brutally honest. That's the secret to a good postmortem. So in summary, you want to do your research. Make sure it's conceptually correct and simple. Make sure it makes sense. Make sure it's simple. Make sure you can follow it. Get some confidence by finding 100 examples of it. I had a friend, as I often say, uh, we, were, we were talking one day, and he's a smart guy. And, in fact, smart people usually make the worst traders, FYI. But he was trading us. He just traded a setup. I'm like, wow, that's kind of an interesting thing you're doing there. When did you learn that? And he says, well, I learned it 10 minutes ago. It's like, well, 10 minutes is not enough time to do do diligence. I learned early on. I was helping someone find setups early on in my career. And I found a setup and I showed the guy and goes, uh, nope, that's not a setup. Yes, it is. The computer recognized the setup. I might even even program the computer. So I knew that the code was valid. And it fits your criteria, one, two, three, and four. And he said, well, even if it is, I don't like it. So that was a bit of an epiphany for me. Like, oh, okay, so it's not this perfect thing. There is a little discretion or at least author's intent to it. So you better make sure you fully wrap your head around whatever setup you're trading. And you do that through a lot, a lot of research. Find the good, find the bad, find the ugly. That's not going to happen in 10 minutes. You're going to need a little bit more time than that. Once you do have something, do your analysis. Once you have confidence in your analysis, then you look to execute. If you don't have confidence in your analysis, which is fine, it's okay not to have anything to do. Just sit on your hands. Then just keep doing your analysis day after day. You find something, plan it. And again, entry stop, initial protective, I'm sorry, initial profit target and trailing stop. Then what do you do? You execute by following what? The process. And again, make as many of those processes. Is it processes or processes? Make as many of those processes passive decisions. Make as many as possible passive decisions. Let the market make decisions for you. And then, of course, do you postmortem? Did you follow the process? Have you picked the best and left the rest? And then, of course, Rinse and repeat. All right, any questions on any of that? Before we get into my least favorite lessons, one of my least favorite lessons, and that's going to be when the SHTF. <laughs> so this morning we had a stock that was starting to look pretty good. It's a short. It's starting to look like it's performing. And what happened? Well, it began to fail miserably because it gapped open. Now, this is a little discretion. This is a little lesson 2.0. Now, as ugly as this gap looks, we had given this position lots of room, and it actually was below the stop. These fast moves on the open, what you could do is let the stock open, and if it hits that stop, you have to have an uncle point in mind, meaning that the stop, by the way, was at 3050. Okay. So have an uncle point in mind. You've already got this big loss overnight. A little bit more incremental loss isn't going to kill you. And I learned this from my futures broker early on when I would get creamed overnight. He's like, okay, well, you got the loss. You already have the loss. Let's see if we can approve upon the situation. Now keep in mind, this does take discipline because if it hits that uncle point and keeps going. You have to get out. No questions asked. But sometimes if you let a stock open, let those opening gyrations happen, a lot of times it might come right back in. So this is a 2.0 lesson in discretion. There's no guarantee it's going to come all the way back in, but it might. 
okay? And you might have survived that open. Can you have a mother of all trades if a sector and market doesn't confirm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you really, really like a setup, okay, if you have a – I hear what you're saying. Ideally, you want all the pieces to fit. But let's say you got a stock that's doing this, and then it begins to accelerate higher. So you've got that acceleration higher. And then let's say you've got a really good knockout move then it might be worth taking even though the sector is doing this and the overall market's doing this and other stocks within the sector are doing that there might be something special going on with the stock and our little friend technical analysis is telling us that there is <laughs> a lot of jokes coming in about uh, me being buff well i thought i was gonna get buff i was down 40 pounds all right, any questions about any of that before we go any further? Uh, I left these in from last week and week before and probably week before that. If we get a death cross in the market, and I'll show you what that is in one second, just a 50 cross and below the 200, it's not the signal in and of itself. It's the magnitude of what happens between the signals, between a death cross and a golden cross, and I'll walk you through that. Be careful not to join a church of what's happening now. Again, as I've said over prior weeks, I'm getting a lot of emails from people who are doing things like selling options and trading reversion to the mean, and that's been working pretty good. And the reason it has been working pretty good is a reversion to the mean system. Basically, you're saying I want to sell here at overbought and I want to buy here at oversold. Okay. And as I have to preach, that'll work until it don't. Until that oversold becomes super duper 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 oversold. So be careful. It's never different this time. It's different this time or the four worst, most dangerous words ever in markets. It's never different this time. All right, let's hop into the charts. And I'll start. Let me just run through the markets fairly quickly. And then if you guys want to talk, talk about individual stocks, we could uh, we could do that. So start punching in the symbols while I get everything set up. By the way, there's a few things you can do, and I've gone through this quite often, so no need to reinvent the wheel. But when you have a stock like this that gaps against you, in this case, it wasn't a – it wasn't – it just sucks is what 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 it does but it, it is but um in this case it wasn't a complete debacle because it only gapped open a little bit above the stop believe it or not we had a very wide stop in that one but the, there's several things you can do when you survive these these opening gap reversals you could put a hard stop in above the intraday high somewhere up here and make that a passive decision to go about your life. You can you can exit intraday. In a case like this, I would stick with it and then just put your hard stop in and forget about it, okay? And just see if it comes all the way back in. Or you can improve your exit. And let's just take a look at the intraday chart. What you could say is like, oh, okay, well, I got screwed on this deal, but if it comes down a little bit, let me just get a little bit better exit out and bail out. So those are the two different things you can do when you get caught up in one of these fast moves on the open or opening gap reversal. Let's take a look at the overall market. And there's a couple of things I want to show you in the sector. It's not a lot, but it's a couple of things I've been preaching lately. The thing that concerns me is this market rallied up and it banged up against this little overhead supply and sold off a little bit. But as you can see, if you didn't know anything about the markets, and let me get my dates right. If you went back to what? February. So February, March, April, a couple of months here and change, almost three months, where the market has done what? It's going sideways. So if you didn't know anything about the markets, you could say, well, where was the market back in February? Where is it now? It's gone sideways over that period. Is a trend follower? That's not a good thing, okay? So make sure you really, really like the setup. 
before going in. As I preach, nothing magical about the 200-day moving average, but it can, and can be in a key word in that sentence, help to keep you on the right side of the market using the concept of daylight, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. And you can see we barely, or I should, say, I should say nearly, we nearly nicked it yesterday, but now we're rallying off of it. We bounced off of it once again. Maybe, just maybe, this is a situation where we bounce off that 200-day moving average through this consolidation, and this builds the base for the next launch into space. I don't know. For me to get excited about this market, I would like to see brand new highs. OK, if we take out these recent lows in here, so let's say circa twenty five fifty, I would begin to become a little bit more nervous about this market. But right now it's chopping sideways. It's sideways at best. Let's take a look at the Nasdaq. Nasdaq has never touched its 200. At least in this correction, or it hasn't touched it, I should say, since when? Since 2016, that was the last time we corrected back to the 200-day moving average. NASDAQ looks a little ugly to me. It's thrust pull back, and then it looks like it's in a thrust here, today notwithstanding. Now, I hope it goes straight up and keeps on going. Much easier to trade the long side of the market. Clients can do it a lot better than shorting. And I think after getting squeezed this morning on a short, they might never want to short again. But longer term, I think you need to learn how to short because it helps you what? See both sides of the market and it's the only way to make money when the market goes down. And why are we here? To make money. Russell 2000, it's just sideways at best. It looks like electrocardiogram. You can go all the way back to when? Last November. And we really haven't made any forward progress. Let's go back to the P's. This is one thing I've been doing lately uh, since uh, Metastock has added my indicators to their, what few indicators I have, but uh, setups and indicators to their software. And that's going to be released next week, I believe. And that's going to be free. Can't beat that price. And I will be doing a webinar on that next week next Wednesday let's take a look at the 50 week moving average or 50 day moving average but let's go to a weekly chart so and I forget if it actually I don't think it actually touched here but telechart uses a rolling weekly chart so let's just see if it actually touched the low is 255380 55380 Moving average, 55499. So oh, it did touch it. It did actually touch it. So that's the first kiss we've had of that moving average in a long, long, long time, going back to 2016. So not the end of the world, but when you start seeing downside daylight like we had back here in 16 and 15, and I was a little bearish back again, certainly was concerned, then I think you have something to really worry about, okay? Maybe, and maybe the key word in that sentence, maybe we're just seeing a little test of that 50-day or 50-week moving average, I should say, like we saw plenty of times between 2012 and 2015. Just pay attention. That's all I'm saying. You can't have a bear market without downside daylight. I've said that for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I'm going to say it again, and I'm going to keep saying it. So write that down. What do we have in 2000? We had downside daylight for how long? Well, for almost all this bear market, we only had one little kiss right here in 2002. And then we didn't have, but we didn't have any upside daylight. We didn't have any ups, downside daylight, I should say, from 2003 on. And then we had a little bit of downside daylight in this last massive leg up since 2009. But as you can see, simple concept, again, keep it simple, can, and can mean a key word in that sentence, help to keep you on the right side of the market. Let's just take a look real quick at the 200-day moving average and the fifty day moving average. Now a few weeks ago, I was talking about, or a week ago at least, I was talking about the fact that the 
50-day moving average was coming down really fast towards the 200-day moving average. What was happening is you have the drop-off effect. You're dropping off prices up here and adding in prices down here. So that average is being forced down. Notice that we've gone mostly sideways lately. So what's the moving average doing? Moving average will have a little lag. Okay. All indicators will have a little lag. But the moving average is now going sideways. So it doesn't look like we're going to get a death cross anytime soon. Unless, of course, the price begins to drop. Okay. My big concern in the sectors is some of these areas like the semiconductors, sort of like the NASDAQ. They rallied up. They made brand new all-time highs. In this case, the semiconductors, maybe 20-year highs or 18-year highs. But significant highs nonetheless. Then they sold off, pulled back, and now they're in what appears to be a new leg lower. We take a look at 200-day moving average there. We can see that we did tag the 200-day moving average just yesterday. Nothing magical about that again, but it can give you a good point of reference. If we stop dropping below it, I'd be really concerned. I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy a semiconductor right now unless it was one, what do they say in Pulp Fiction? It has to be one charming pig, okay? It has to be a really good looking stock. As you go through these sectors, you'll see a lot are either sideways trading below the 200 or just ugly. So take a look at those at your leisure. There's a couple of areas doing okay. Energy is doing okay in here. For me to get excited about energies, I sure would like to see brand new highs. Metals and mining were trying to get their act together, but then they began to implode a little bit, and that was led mostly, I think, by copper. Freeport MacMoron, I think, was the uh, stock that led the copper stocks lower there. But just take a look at most of these areas as time allows. And there's a few that are doing okay. I say okay, trading sideways, such as health services. But for the most part, most areas look at fairly ugly in here. There's the transports. You had the big picture retrace rally. Sell off, retrace rally, stalled out, and has never taken out that retrace rally high. As I preach... Take a look at something like bow ties in these cases, and it really didn't make a clean bow tie, but clean enough for government work. Until and unless it takes out the old highs, then this top remains in place, as I say quite often when talking about these transitional setups. So just go through your sectors and notice that a lot made its new highs, but then have begun to roll back over. Let's just take a look at bonds real quick. Again, this is one of those areas that only matters when it matters. Now we're back to a time, point in time, where it begins to matter again. We're probing down towards these 2017, 16, 15, not 14, but 15 lows. If we take out 115 on the TLT, I'd begin to get a little bit worried. Okay. All right, let's start looking at some individual stocks for you guys. The question is... Dathan says, is Lulu example of the mother of all trades with the sector and the market not confirming? Well, Lulu is kind of all over the place when you look at it longer term. It gaps up and then it gaps down and it gaps up. It looks like a stock that's held hostage by earnings if I would just look at it. So I would be really leery about that. The other problem that I see with Lulu is you've got this big gap up here. And yes, it's continued higher. But it was off to the races and then just made this upward drift. I would like to see just the opposite happen, an upward drift followed by acceleration. So, no, Lulu would not be, even if it's set up, if it pulled back, it would not be the mother of all setups because it's not accelerating higher. It is drifting higher in here. So let's pass on that one. FSM for Mr. Phil. Hey, Phil. This looks okay. It's a silver stock. Let's take a look at silver real quick. Silver looks a little dubious at best. It was off at a races a few days ago, and then it's imploding again. So if we go back to FSM, it looks okay. 
it did break out past its prior highs. Uh, one thing longer term, it's got a ton and ton of resistance over here. I know it's a long time ago, but markets sometimes have long memories. I would pass unless it knocks your socks off over here. Like unless it was going straight up and then it had a really big TKO type of move or something down, then I might be interested. But the fact that it's got so much overhead supply, I would pass. HRS, enough pullback. All right. Donna, you're next. Uh, too much pullback. In fact, not enough trend. Okay. Notice that it took off. It broke out of the space. That's a good thing. Okay. Then it came right back in. So, no, it's not a setup. And then take a look at your net net price change. You can go back until January, as you can see, and it's pretty much gone nowhere. So, pass on that one. MTUS from his Donna. Okay. It's not finding it. MT, MTUS. All right, uh, can you give me that, that uh, symbol again, Don? In the meantime, let's take a look at INXN. Um, INXN, the problem with this one is that it's kind of like that one we just looked at. It really hasn't broken out that much before it came back in. You can see it kind of came out of this base in here and then came back in. So I would pass on this one. Maybe put on your watch list. I'm a little leery of stocks that are at high levels. At this point in time, worried that they could become a source of funds if the market begins to tank in general. Or what's kind of perverse is if the market begins to rally, sometimes these higher price stocks get sold off and lower price stocks get bought in. I should say stocks at lower levels. But right now, this is not a setup because when in doubt, draw your sideways, draw your arrows and see. And you can see that it really hasn't made much progress in a long, long time. Net, net price change, very, very powerful thing. Okay. Donna, you had, you had another one. Uh, oh, Timas. Okay. I must have fat fingered something. Okay. No, uh, this is the mother of all sideways trades. Go back to August. Where was it? $64. Where is it now? No. Pass on that one. We need to find something that's a little bit more trending, okay? WTI. This one's okay, but notice that it really didn't get far past this prior peak in here. For me to get excited, I have to go a little bit further, higher, and then maybe pull back. But that does look like something that's trending a little bit, OSG. You're welcome, Steve. And then... Since you're so nice, we'll go to you next. Um, this one's kind of all over the place. I think this that's that crazy one that a while back went nuts. I forget why. They, they figured out it was super duper short or something. So based on that crazy action, I'd probably pass. Uh, there's another shipper out there. Maybe I'll show it to you. It looks a lot better if you want to go sh after shipping. I'm not a huge fan of the shippers. They tend to chop around a lot from my research. All right, I'll show you the one that looks a little better because you guys are being so nice. This one looks a little bit better if you want to go after a shipper. What do we have? Well, it's a new issue, so that helps, okay? It's accelerating its trend, and it's a TKO slash pullback. That looks like a decent-looking setup. To me, notice in more recent times, it's not only accelerated higher, even shorter term, but it's been fairly persistent. It's run higher. A little bit on the thin side, a lot of it thin today, so be super duper careful on that. But I would rather go after something that looks like that if you had to go after a shipper or wanted to go after a shipper, okay? TDMN. I'm sorry, EXK for Steve. EXK is going to be what? Eastman? Oh, no, it's a silver company. Never mind. Uh, first thing kind of jumps out at me is has a lot of trading above where it is. So it's going to have a hard time getting through all that overhead supply. Uh, it looks okay. If I was just seeing this, you got a little bit of a gap here, maybe a little bit more pullback. I'd say, yeah, it looks pretty good. But you got to always take you have to always take it in context and say, well, it's so much trading here. 
it's probably going to run into a lot of trouble. So I would leave that alone based on that. And let's take a look at silver one more time. Silver is kind of uh, questionable at best. Okay, let's go back in time and see. Go back to 2017. Was that a year and a half ago, roughly, almost? And it's gone absolutely nowhere on a net net basis. F and D. This one's okay. It came all the way back into its breakout. That's my only problem there. If it would have gone further higher and then had that little double top knockout move, wow, what did I do? That's kind of cool. Uh, then I'd be a little bit more excited about it if it looked more like that. But notice that it barely got past its base, and then it came right back in. So I would pass based on that action. Now, also keep in mind, I'm going to be a little bit more particular given the nature of the market. Okay, Kroger, the problem here, Donna, is, again, we're trend followers, and there's no trend to follow. Okay, it's drifted up in recent times, but it's getting ready to hit all this supply. It's got a gap down, and then longer term, it looks like an electrocardiogram. Okay, remember, we want something to look like that and a pullback or at least bottoming out in a bow tie or something like that. But don't give up, okay? Keep coming. To, somebody came, somebody's like was complaining because I never liked their setups. Well, they, they weren't paying attention to the trend. Okay, so here's a stock that's trending. It is an energy. That's a good thing. And it's broken out to new highs. But what's missing? There's something missing. It's a setup. We need a setup. It's been a little wide and loose in the past, but it's starting to get its act together. So we need to wait for a setup. You said it's an IPO? Well, maybe it's a toddler. It's been it's been on the market for a few years. T D T N D M tandem. T N D M. Well, looks like we've got a line drawn in from last week. Too much overhead supply. And then as I said last week, this huge gap up, came all the way back in. Now it's it's just all over the place. HV of 80, fairly volatile. I would leave that one alone. Sprint. Sprint I probably won't like just because it's a big fat stock. Well, here's one problem. Notice that this, this whole rally here is pretty much one day. So ideally, now don't get me wrong, I like wide range bars, but you want to see more than just one little wide range bar. Lots of overhead supply, but I guess that's far enough away to be a good problem if it got all the way up there. But I would pass because that whole rally is just one little bar. A lot of times you get a one and done type of move. Okay. All right, we're nearly out of time. Anyone have any last last stocks you want to talk about? Going once, going twice. All right. Well, obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming once again. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule once again. So thank you guys so much. Any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.